Hi, I'm Jono from ACS Custom. I'm here at Icing Magazine and I'm going to be interviewing Paul Checkley from Harley Street Hearing and Musicians Hearing Services. So, hello Paul. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Good, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're making a video about all about ears. Um, and so I thought we'd start about, uh, start with the basics of um, uh, what is sound and, and how the ear works. So I don't know if you could just take us through kind of what happens when these vibrations uh, in, a, in, in air, in a gas basically, um, go into our ears. Go into our ears. Well, we have a, an, an outer ear, which is almost like a funnel, mm. and that funnels those little vibrations down into our ear canal. Um, and there they find the eardrum. The eardrum is an is a elastic membrane okay. which moves back and forward. Um, attached to the eardrum on the other side are some little bones. Uh, these little bones vibrate that like a transformer okay. uh, because we're now going to transform those little vibrations from, a, from the air into a fluid filled medium which is our cochlea. This okay. is the, uh, the business end of our hearing. Mm. Uh, and inside the cochlea those little sound waves move uh, some little cells up and down and as those cells move they become displaced and that's what sends an impulse to our brain that we recognize as the sound. Right, so the cochlea is like that snail-like organ in the inner ear and those sensory hair cells you say like a piano keyboard so is there any difference at either end of the cochlea, sort of high yeah, frequencies, so low frequencies? Absolutely, so if we draw that analogy back to the piano key it's actually the opposite way around so the high uh, frequency sensors if you like are at the at the front yeah, yeah. Uh, and then at the apex which is at the other end is where we hear the low frequencies. Yeah. So I suppose the, the, the higher frequencies, uh, higher and mid frequencies, get more of a battering. If you say those vibrations are coming in um, to the cochlea through the fluid, those sensory hair cells are getting quite a battering at the It the would tend to be the high frequencies which get, yeah, which would get affected first. Yeah. Yeah. And do we find with, um, what sort of frequencies do you usually see music induced hearing loss? So music, music in general, as, as with any noise, is, is a broadband frequency. So we, we hear lots of different pitches while we're listening to music um, rather than a specific frequency. And when we, are, when we have a broadband input, that's a, a, a lot of different pitches, we characteristically see a dip in the high frequencies. It's usually around four kilohertz. Right. Uh, it can extend either side depending on the amount of damage, but usually around four kilohertz is where it first starts to show, okay. which is a relatively high similar to the sound of an S or a T. Right, so do you find that people have problems in certain situations with uh, conversations? If you say that, so say constant sounds, do they? Absolutely, yeah. so what yeah. you would generally find, the, the early stages of a, of a noise induced type loss would be that maybe you don't hear quite so clearly when you're with friends in a restaurant, right. Um, right. because what we're missing there are uh, I, I, as we say, the high frequency consonants are things like t and k and s, uh, mm -hmm. and these are, these are extremely important sounds when we're actually trying to understand what people are saying. So we may hear that people have spoken, but we're not always quite sure what they've said. Okay. So sensory hair cells um, excite the uh, cochlear nerve through to the auditory nerve to the brain. So I suppose really, in actual fact, you're kind of hearing with your brain. Is that right? The ear Absolutely. is more of a mechanism of transfer of transmission of sound if we get into the realms of uh, acoustics versus psychoacoustics <laughs> so acoustics is the transmission of sound and the mm. movement of sound through a medium um, and psychoacoustics is what happens or how we react to that sound when we when we perceive it in our brain okay what sort of frequencies going back to music induced hearing loss what sort of instruments are usually um, are those kind of f frequencies that could cause damage more so? All of them. All of them, yeah. okay. So there's nothing specifically that would cause damage more than others because mm. it's all about the uh, length of uh, duration of the sound and the right. level. So if you have a, a, a sound at a particular frequency, the damage in the cochlea is usually one octave above that frequency. Okay. So if I played a one kilohertz tone to you very, mm. very loud for an extended mm. period, you would usually have damage at two so, kilohertz. That's interesting. So okay. on a broadband signal, mm. when we have a three kilohertz um, resonant mm. peak in the ear canal, mm. that's why we always see it at 4 kilohertz because right. we've got a broadband signal mm. 
with an elevated peak at three kilohertz. Mm. So the damage is always it shows at four, four first. Right. So we're seeing more damage um, sort of in the mid frequencies, I suppose you say, sort of from one kilohertz upwards, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And as you know, with my hearing, that I've got mild music-induced hearing loss yeah. and tinnitus, is that um, for years I was standing next to drummers. So I suppose cymbals, hi-hats, snare drums, I suppose, are sitting more in that frequency bandwidth, possibly? Uh, they are, but it, it's more about the fact that those instruments are extremely loud. Okay. Um, so we're looking at, when we're looking at how noise can damage our ears, we're looking, there are two elements to it. The first is that a quieter noise, which goes on for a longer time, mm. causes damage, mm -hmm. or a shorter noise at a, lou a, a louder, shorter duration of mm. noise. So we're looking at a, a kind of an average level in a room, somebody who's working in a factory or, or playing in an orchestra, we're looking at the average level of, the, of, of that orchestra over a period of time, but okay. we're also looking at each crash on the cymbal mm. or each... As a peak. As a as peak, a peak. Yeah, yeah. So see. we need to be ensuring that the levels, so the average level of that music is at a level that's not uh, uncomfortable or, or could potentially cause damage. But we're also making sure that the peaks are not uh, in themselves causing damage. Right. So in terms of, so it's um, amplitude or loudness of sound compared to the time, time is what you're saying. Absolutely. So if we were now looking at um, safe exposure times, mm -hmm. um, what, what, what would we say, say if we started at say, uh, I mean, I know myself that maybe a drum kit is um, around sort of 94, 97 decibels, but let's just go a little bit back. Let's go maybe at 85 dB, yeah. 85 decibels. What's, what's your safe exposure time then? And then in increments, how, how does it change how as you go up? Mm. So um, the European regulations say that um, we are that as an average daily dose. So we're talking about... Uh, Noise is cumulative, so um, okay. you know if we're going, to, if we if we on the tube on the way to work, and that's at a certain level, and then we're going and playing in an orchestra for three hours, and that's at a certain level. Mm. It kind of all adds together as a dose over the day. Right. So 85 dB is the European guideline for a safe. If 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 the sound is below 85 dB, it's considered to be safe for mm. eight hours of, of every day. But because um, the decibel scale is, an, is a logarithmic scale, it has to be because the, the difference between the quietest sound that we can hear and the loudest sound that we can tolerate is a huge, huge scale, which would run from here down to Finchley Road Tube Station. So in order to make it manageable, we turn that into a logarithmic right, scale. Yeah. But the effect of that on, on, on our measurements means that if every three decibel increase okay. in measured intensity, mm -hmm doubles the loudness. So it's twice as loud. Twice as Every loud. Every 3 dB, twice it's as twice loud. twice as loud. Yeah. Therefore, if, we, it, if it's twice as loud, the, the safe exposure time is half as much. Half as much. So if we go from 85 dB to 88 dB, we're doubling the loudness and therefore halving our exposure right. time. So we're already down to four hours. Mm. If we take that up to 91, another three, we're going down to two hours mm. and up to 94 and we're down to one hour. So, yeah. so by the time we're up to sort of 100, 105, which mm. a lot of amplified music, mm. we're immediately unsafe as soon as we get into that environment. Right. So, that, so if you think of a, an onstage uh, setup with uh, backline guitar amps, bass amps, drum kit, you're probably looking around 97 to 100 dB. So, so that means that your safe exposure time without any protection is about 15 minutes? Yeah, roughly. That's, that's pretty crazy. Which, I wish I knew that 25 yeah, yeah, years ago. Absolutely. Yeah, which is... And you may have rehearsed already on that day. Yeah, exactly. And you may have also travelled along a very, very noisy street on your way mm. to work. So it's... So yeah. it's your exposure dose, if you like, for the day. Um, for, for the for the for the day. Yeah. So probably lo not a lot of musicians and singers, um, especially standing at the front of the band, would would understand necessary or be aware that their safe exposure time is quite short. If you take into consideration rehearsals, studio sessions, live gigs, etc., and their environmental noise, it's, yeah. it's, it's not very long at it's all. It's not is it? long at all. No. no. Almost as soon as they're on stage, they're already at risk. So let's move on to um, hearing protection. So we've uh, seen how uh, the ear is, can be damaged, how long you've got. Um, 
let's talk about hearing hearing protection. Obviously, there's various types of uh, hearing protection on the on the market, yeah. um, of which ACS make uh, universal and custom fit. Um, so. I mean, what are we trying to do with hearing protection for musicians, especially for singers? So the problem with hearing protection as such, in, uh, in effect, most people have heard of little foam plugs that you can mm. put in tubes. you see them <clears throat> all the time. Um, and the problem with those is that they will attenuate some frequencies more than others, and they'll mm. generally damp down more in the high frequencies than they will in the low frequencies. So when mm. you put those things on, it's quite difficult already to understand what people are saying to you because we're dumbing down some of those high pitch sounds which we've already said are quite important when we're listening to people speaking. But also as a musician, um, a musician obviously or a singer has to be uh, hear the music exactly as to hear all, all the frequencies fidelity, yeah. appropriately. Yeah, at a good fidelity. Mm. So um, the ideal type of plug for that environment would be uh, and for that particular user, a, a singer or, or musician, would be um, something which allows them to hear the music in exactly the same way, but just uh, reduce the level, yeah, in effect mm. turn the volume down. Which is what they call a, attenuation. An so attenuating so attenuation, attenuating hearing protection, uh, whether it's a universal fit ear plug or, or a custom fit is, is better for musicians. Absolutely, yeah. Right. So I know at and, and ACS we, we make different levels of attenuation, which is different filters that turn it down, if you like, a certain amount of uh, reduces the sound pressure. But um, some people find a bit of a problem. If, they, if, they're, t if they're turning down the sound too much outside of, uh, in their, their outside environment, when they sing, it's a bit like sticking your fingers in your ears. Absolutely. We and you call get that this, occlusion. The occlusion, occlusion effect. Okay. That's a build so up of low frequency energy in the ear canal. And that's a perfect example. When you put your fingers in your ears, you get this build up. You, te you hear yourself internally. Right. Uh, and that's a big problem for um, brass players, yeah. woodwind players, and obviously singers who, mm. who uh, uh, can be more aware of their internal sound than the sound that's actually. So what's happening there? Is it the vibrations are going through the internal the, the, vibrations are, yeah. are being uh, and the, the 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 low frequency energy of those vibrations are being sort of held in by mm. uh, by the plugs in the ears. Yeah. Does that cause a problem for some sing? I mean, some singers, you know, you stick your finger in your ear to try, and if you're singing a two three part harmony, but some singers find that their intonation. Um, pitching wise because it, it's a bit of a problem if they've got too much because they're too aware of what's going on inside okay. we're, we're lucky enough to have filters at, at different levels we can choose the filter appropriately to match the the needs of the individual but generally speaking with a singer you would tend to, to fit a slight, slightly lower attenuation yeah. level which will give, give a singer more feeling of or less feeling of occlusion, so okay. it makes everything feel a bit more open. And what 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 sort of levels of attenuation are you looking at? I mean, with the ACS filters, uh, there's a 10 dB, 15 dB, 17 dB, 20 dB. What what sort of we level would, tend would you tend to go below 15? Below 15. I always, okay. with singers, I always say that to them that it's better if you can to have a higher level, depending on what they do. If they're yeah. you know, particularly if they're in a rock band or whatever, it's going to mm -hmm. be loud. I say to them, and, and, and we allow them to trial different levels. So, mm. And I always say choose a higher one because if you can, it would be good to have a higher level. So I would mm. say maybe start them at a 15. But if they're not finding that easy to, to use, then we can always drop them down yeah. to a 10 or whatever. So we've talked about universal fit earplugs, which look like, uh, like Christmas trees, or they can have yeah. a memory foam type uh, arrangement, or the custom moulded ones, which uh, are custom made for your ears. Yeah. Um, ACS are obviously made from a, made from a soft silicon um, which is material. Ideal because it moves. Uh, Move. Obviously, a singer's moving their jaw quite a lot. Yeah. Quite often, actually, with singers, we will have them take. We, we, because as you as your mouth moves, also your ear canal moves. So what some singers find is as they're singing, they get an event through their plug. Okay. So we would tend to take the impression of the ear, which we do with a soft silicon paste, mm -hmm. with their mouth open. Okay. So that when they're on stage, they're not getting this this break yeah. in their seal. So soft silicon. Same with in ear monitors. Yeah, soft silicon is is, is a lot better. It, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let's just talk about the ear impression process so you have to have a mold taken of your ear do you just want to take us through just briefly how, how that's done at Harley Street yeah ear? so it's a it's a, a small foam or, or cotton bud we call it or it's called no to stop it fits into the ear canal it's 
A bit like a cotton bud with a piece of cotton attached yeah, to it. The yeah. cotton wool bit of a cotton mm. bud with a, with, okay. a, with, a cot, with a piece of cotton attached to it. So uh, when, it, when that goes into manufacture, it's useful in, during the manufacturing process if we can get as... If that person who's manufacturing that uh, earplug knows as much about that ear canal as they possibly yeah. can. So, so is it, we, we usually say up to the second bend. Second bend. In the so the ear canal is... Yeah. If you look down <laughs> on someone's head, the ear canal is like an S laying on its side. Um, and we so we have the first bend and then we come into the second bend and we try and get just around that second bend so you know exactly what's happening in that ear canal mm. um, and that's pushed in with a little thing called a pen light and then um, or an auto light and then we use a, a soft silicon it's called an addition reaction silicone it's basically a, a soft silicon mm. paste which is put in using <coughs> a little um, uh, device um, and we're literally filling the ear with a with a with a soft silicon, which takes two or three minutes to set. So it's totally like, like a plasticine mold of mold, pretty of, much, mold yeah, of your ears. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, so then ACS, we get those. Uh, we we then scan that with a with a laser and create a three D model. Um, so then we we have a three D model of the person's ear, and then we three D print that to make the mold, and then inject, inject the silicon into it. Um, which is quite good because also we have everybody's ears on file. Absolutely, and they lose them all the time. So we can we can remake. So you them. can reorder by phone. Is, the, is that right? The, the ear continues to grow for your entire life. It so does. yeah. So yeah, it does. do you need to have? Unfortunately, in my case, is it more is it more so with men than women? <laughs> no, it's not. no, really, no, it's not. Okay, but you see a lot of guys stop. with big ears. Is that to compensate yeah. for selective hearing? <laughs> <laughs> but you do, yeah, your ears do continue to grow. Okay. But we, we would say, um, roughly, and I think uh, you, your laboratory people would, would say the same thing, mm. um, around every four to five years, you okay. should think to have them remoulded. Mm. Um, the, the other thing is with, with oils of the skin and so on, and use, the, the, it's probably as well to replace your filters uh, at the same okay. time. So we would, tech, we would advise people four to five every years. Every four, four years. Yeah, they would get some new ones done. Brilliant. Okay. So custom hearing protection is, is the best way to go. A custom fit soft silicon hearing protector earplug is probably, you would say, is best. Um, price point wise for that, um, well, I know the ACS ones, but we're, we're probably looking at around £140. 140 to £170, yeah. Pounds, yeah. yeah. And that includes having the ear, having in, the impression ear impressions done, yeah. taken, which is, which is why, and it's great news that's just happened actually recently, is the charity um, Help Musicians UK have launched a, a new scheme or a new campaign called the Musicians Hearing Health Scheme, yeah. which is to subsidise the cost of hearing protection for for musicians, for which music. which is fantastic. Amazing, it's, an, it's yeah. such a good offer. Yeah. So it's something that we. I mean, the the initial, the driver behind it was raising awareness um, among musicians yeah. because some aren't aware that the the, uh, the potential risks of um, of hearing damage from loud music, um, but it gives access to really good custom fitted hearing protection at a, a, a fraction of the price. So mm. that, uh, plus. Um, plus a, a hearing assessment and some advice from an audiologist on appropriate hearing protection for appropriate levels and some advice about um, the, the European regulations and so on. So it, it's, more, it, it's looking at, rather than just providing earplugs, it's, looking at, um, it, it's about looking after your ear health. Hearing conservation, hearing yeah, which conservation is really, generally, really important. Yeah. And there's more information, I believe, at um, hearformusicians.org.uk. Absolutely. And you, they can apply, uh, musicians can apply online? Yeah, there's an online application form and you'll hear within three to five days whether you've been successful. Okay. Um, you just need to show that you're earning a percentage of your income um, from music. From music, which is fantastic. Yeah. So they get a one-to-one a -one hearing assessment and a hearing test. Yeah. And, and, then, and then you guys would take the moulds and then they get a pair of uh, the plugs, yeah. ACS uh, hearing, protection. hearing protection. Fantastic. Yeah. Just talking very briefly about, uh, I mean, I know a lot of our viewers uh, from Icing Magazine will be teaching. Uh, teaching the next generation of uh, <laughs> singers and music makers uh, and as you know I feel quite passionate about this because of the, the um, hearing damage that I've got and also my tinnitus that hearing conservation and, and, and ed raising this awareness in education is is the key yeah what, what are your feelings on that absolutely um, I know that uh, we've been in fact I was at a meeting yesterday with our musicians looking at um, uh, uh, at the moment 
students specifically are not uh, are not um, eligible for the scheme simply because of they're not earning a percentage of but obviously as you say there it's an important group because if we start them young with the idea of, of protecting their ears they'll carry that through mm. their careers so with, with the right sort of hearing protection because yeah, obviously absolutely yeah because yeah. they still want to hear the music I suppose yeah. if they're you can be using foam earplugs they're gonna have a bad experience of using hearing protection and put them off yeah so uh, we've been looking at, at, at schemes for what, what you might call emerging musicians because okay. obviously there are there are also lots of young musicians who maybe aren't at u music college or uh, are sure. not in music education who are also uh, going to be embarking on a career in music so it's so it's looking yeah at, at the young mu uh, people joining the industry because mm. no, I mean my generation of uh, as, as a musician I worked professionally 15 years uh, I went through music education um, system if you like, you know, music at school, O-level music, there you go, that's how old I am, uh, A-level degree, even two years at the BBC, nobody said that I could be damaging my hearing. Do you think, which I feel quite angry about, yeah. um, and even in the industry nobody mentioned it, we just thought you'd come off stage and you'd have that that, that, that muffledness, you know, your hearing's gone all muffled. What, so what, what's that is, called? This is something yeah. we call temporary threshold shift. Yeah. So obviously we talked earlier on about the little vibrations travelling through the fluid of the cochlea. If those are very big vibrations yeah. um, and there's a lot of displacement of the membranes, we get some temporary damage to those membranes okay. and to the cells which are responsible mm. for, for transmitting the sound. Um, we call that temporary threshold shift. It usually, and that will be when you leave a noisy environment. You you, you feel a bit dull. The ears mm, maybe ringing muffled, slightly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember years of that. Absolutely. Mm, well, yeah. that takes maybe 24 to 48 hours to return. So the okay. cells kind of restore themselves. The problem is that with continued exposure, with this continually mm. happening, in the end they don't begin to restore themselves, or they restore themselves only to a, a percentage of their of their uh, mm. former level. So um, it's about continuing the exposure and causing more damage as you continue it. And once the damage is done, once that temporary threshold shift becomes permanent, that is it. And they die off. They yeah. die and there is no cure or no, uh, they won't return. Mm. And also uh, temporary ringing, I mean, with my tinnitus, uh, as you, it would go away after a gig, maybe the next day it would have gone away. And then I always remember having a, um, a, a two-week holiday um, and it didn't go away. Um, but that, that temporary ringing, is that also, that temporary tinnitus, is that also a sign that the sensory hair cells are being damaged in 100%. the cochlea? 100%. You can think of that dull hearing and that temporary ringing or the ringing sound, you can think of that as your body telling you that you were in an environment that was too loud for right. your ears. Yeah. So if you are coming off stage and you've got that muffledness, temporary threshold shift, temporary tinnitus, temporary ring, you know that you've temporarily damaged, damaged your, your, your hearing. And so that's hopefully kind of, not permanently. Yeah. So going back to education is the key. Um, we need to be, you know, we need to be installing this into mainstream education, surely. I mean, obviously when, um, and, and as you say, not all musicians would go through formal uh, further or higher education. So really, telling kids about this at school is, is paramount. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what you were saying earlier on about um, nobody told you, it's interesting that the first piece of research which, which showed that um, noise can actually damage your hearing wasn't until about 1965. Really? And in the UK, the first, the first, and it wasn't a law at the time, and it's only relatively recently that it's become law, um, uh, the first sort of guidance on, on noise damage wasn't until the kind of early to mid 70s. Right. So, it, it, and I think the, the problem with, 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 with musicians and music is that when we talk about noise damage, we always talk about noise damage. Mm. Um, you, you mentioned earlier on hearing conservation, which is actually a much better term because mm. we don't think of that as a noise because we like hear, listening yeah, to it. Yeah, noise is an unwanted sound. Absolutely, like. yeah. but any sound, mm. if it's at the right level, but if it's music or whatever it is, it's going to do the same damage. Mm. Singing teachers out there, it, it would be great to sort of challenge them and say, you know, inform the next generation of, of singers and music Had makers. Had they thought about yeah. the possible damage of yeah. hearing? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah.
So if you're getting, you're coming off stage and you've got that muffledness, that, that ringing in the ears, and that proves, as you say, that there is some temporary or permanent damage, what should, what should they do next? What, what should musicians do next? So, so here, noise-induced hypnosis is a bit of an invisible threat. It's, it, it's not something that you will necessarily notice in all environments. There'll be some environments which you're finding maybe you're not hearing quite so well when you with friends in a restaurant or um, and this uh, without noise-induced damage can happen without tinnitus. People just need to be aware of any changes in their hearing if they're if they are experiencing tinnitus. Um, is that permanent? If, if there are any changes to your hearing, you think you may be experiencing tinnitus, ringing or, or, or hissing in your ears, um, you should get to your GP and the, your GP will hopefully refer you on to a specialist in the area, an ENT surgeon or, okay. or a specialist audiologist. Because I know that some, some uh, colleagues and uh, people in the industry not knocking GPs, but they sometimes have a bit of a bad experience. Uh, GPs I from what I don't know if this is true or not, but their training in audiology is sometimes, unless they've expressed an interest in it, they, they don't really have an awful lot of training when they do their GP training in they audiology. Don't. So should, would it be better, what I'm trying to say is, would it be better to try and get yourself self-referred onto a, an audiologist or maybe even go to a, a specialist like Harley Street Hearing? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you see an audiologist, they, the audiologist will be able to test your hearing They'll be able to look at your noise history and they'll be able to give you some advice about, at right. least some advice about where to go next. Okay. And some specialist tests to look, has there been permanent damage done to the ear? And if so, what's, where, where's the best place to go next? All right. So seeing a specialist, seeing a specialist is, is, the best, absolutely. is the best. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked about signs of how the damage could have already happened or warning signals if you like with that muffledness the ringing in, in your ears uh, and obviously um, hearing damage is is not just for older people is it it can happen i mean i know myself we we work in ibiza uh, with a lot of djs there and i've spoken to a lot of uh, young djs in their mid-20s that have already got problems with their it's problems with their not hearing and old people's thing so really protecting yourself or being aware of the information that you've just given us about um, exposure time, exposure levels, and really protecting your protecting yourself early really yeah, is, I mean, is important. We were talking earlier on about what, what might be the signs that you have a noise-induced hearing loss. If we have signs of noise-induced hearing loss, it's almost too late. Really? Um, because mm. by noise-induced hearing loss, we can't do it, we can't cure it, we, it's permanent. Mm. So really the, the key here has to be, as you say, understanding that if sounds, music, noise are loud, they will damage your ears. So mm. you need to be getting in early before the damage happens. Right. So protect yourself before protect it's too it, late. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul, from Harley Street Hearing. Uh, very important advice there about hearing conservation and protecting your hearing before it's too late. We talked about the Musicians Hearing Health Scheme run by Help Musicians UK. Obviously you have to apply to get onto that project. Um, however, ACS Custom, Harley Street Hearing and Musicians Hearing Services are also offering ICing uh, members a discount, which you can find out more information about that on the members area on the iSing magazine website. So if you're serious about sound and want to protect your hearing, you really need to play safe now so you can still hear tomorrow. <laughs>